So Martin Wolf is our next keynote speaker. He is associate editor and chief economics commentator at the Financial Times in London, as many of you know. He is one of the most influential writers on economics in the world. And since 1999, he has been, been a forum fellow of the annual World Economic Forum. And during his impressive career, he has received many prizes and distinctions, like for example, the Winkert Foundation Senior Prize for Excellence in Financial Journalism, and the Commentator of the Year Award at the Business Journalist of the Year Awards. His most recent books are Why Globalization Works and Fixing Global Finance. Martin, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for that kind introduction. Um, you didn't mention that one of the prizes I have won is called the Ludwig Erhardt Prize. And uh, I was given it, won it, I think, about three years ago. I am reasonably confident that in light of what I have recently been writing, I would not receive this prize again. And actually, I've been slightly surprised, and I regard it as very encouraging that nobody has written to me asking for it back. It's always a tremendous honor and pleasure for me uh, to speak here in the Netherlands. Um, as some of you may know, in May 1940, my grandfather, who was a fish merchant in Amerden, um, hijacked a trawler, uh, took his family to England, where famously they were met by an immigration official in, I think, Hull, one of, because the, the trawler captain only knew the fishing ports of England. Um, who famously looked at my grandfather and his bedraggled family and asked him, tell me, Mr. Weinschenk, why have you come to England? Um, anyway, my mother promptly left the f took a job with the uh, Frei Nederland, uh, with immense pleasure left the family home, moved in with my father. This was 1943 and she was unmarried. And, uh, and here I am. So, <laughs> one of the innumerable strange consequences of the European history of the first half of the 20th century. Uh, what I have to say is, I think, very complementary to what Danny has to say. Uh, at an earlier stage in thinking about remarks, I thought how I might respond to what I expected him to say, but I haven't done so, so we can leave that to our discussion. I'm going to touch on two issues. First, what I think is very broadly going on in the world economy at the moment. And when I say at the moment, I mean long, fairly long-term forces. I don't mean right today. I mean uh, how we should think of the processes now at work. And then I'm going to talk relatively brief, briefly and obviously superficially about the possible ways for engaging with those forces of a rich, open, prosperous, successful democratic state like the Netherlands embedded in a European Union in some trouble. Now, the challenges or where we are, what's going on in the world, I'm going to uh, talk essentially about three things, globalization, convergence, and crisis. Those are, I think, the three elements. So let me start with globalization, the, the, the phenomenon that, uh, that Danny was talking about. In my book on, called Why Globalization Works, I argue that one way of thinking about globalization is that it's a consequence of two actually interacting processes, but two processes. One is technological, the reduction in the costs of transactions due to, due to technological change, which of course operate within and across borders, but are particularly relevant where large distances are concerned. So I'm particularly concerned with those technologies. And then there are policy choices, which is what Danny uh, focused on. Obviously, we have a great deal of freedom 
and what we can do about policy, and we know that matters because we saw that in the 30s. It makes a lot of difference what policies we pursue. Justice made a lot of difference after the war. But we can't do so much about the former. And some of those changes, one in particular, are very profound. Technology. There are two fundamental relevant technologies in thinking about globalization. One is the cost of transport of goods and people, physical things, and the other is the cost of assembling, processing, and transmitting information. In the movement of goods and people, we are living in an era of te technological stagnation. We have had no fundamental breakthroughs in technologies in these areas, I would argue, for about a century, the last being the aeroplane. We can debate the rocket, obviously consistent, important for satellite communications. And of course, there have been some extremely important innovations within these systems. The container ship may be regarded as particularly important, the jumbo jet, but even these are now 40 or 50 years old. They haven't changed. In information processing and technology, however, the transformation is profound, and I'm just putting up one chart which shows what has happened to the most interesting area, which is mobile telephony and the internet, just in the last 10 years. And you can see all these technologies, particularly the, uh, including the internet, have expanded very rapidly in penetration, but the most extraordinary one is the explosion of mobile telephony, and today, in fact, roughly speaking, there are as many handsets as there are people on the planet. There has never been a major technology that has penetrated the world so quickly. Since there is a convergence, as we all know, of the internet with mobile telephony, and the costs of networks are falling very, very swiftly, we can assume, it seems to me, that within a relatively short period of time, all the information that is on the internet which is going to be basically everything, will be accessible to everybody. And I think it's impossible to exaggerate the significance of that transformation for the world in which we live. Economics is just a small part of that. And the second part, point I wanted to emphasize, and I, for lack of time, I've just had to touch on the high points, is... Um, what uh, Danny focused on, the policy area. I'm not looking at financial integration just because of lack of time. I do whole presentations, of course, on this. This is a rather interesting chart put together by the IMF a few years ago after the Uruguay round was completed. And uh, uh, the top are the developed countries, the industrial countries, then the new industrializing countries are green, and below are the Asians and uh, uh, the, uh, so the Latin American countries and below them developing Asia, so the leading regions of the emerging developing world. And the, uh, the way to think about this chart, very simply, it's average tariffs, so it focuses on trade, and complete free trade will be a line on the top, 100%. It, the, the, it so happens the way it's calibrated, complete free trade will be the abolition of border restrictions. And in this case, uh, you can see that there was a quite extraordinary convergence by developing Asia and Latin America on the, the trade policies of the developed world and the, and the newly industrializing countries over the period uh, 1980 to the middle of the last decade. This has not been reversed. We are not making any further progress. The Doha round has clearly failed, but it has not been reversed. And much the same will be said of what's happened in terms of financial integration financial liberalization. I'm not going to talk about whether it's good or bad, but basically there was substantial liberalization by many countries. It didn't include fully China or India, though even in China, the current account is now completely liberal. That's a very remarkable change, but uh, uh, we are basically stuck there in the moment. The second element of my story is uh, convergence, and I think it's possibly even more important than the globalization and technology story that I've given you. Um, we've lived in a world, and we're so used to it, that we can't even recognize it's disappearing. It's the world that has been the case for at least two centuries. It's the world the West ran. And we no longer live in that world. And we're, the world is slipping away from us, in that sense, at astonishing, breathtaking speed. In the 19th century, 
There occurred what Kenneth Pomerantz, a very distinguished and I think brilliant economic historian uh, working in the University of California, called the Great Divergence. In the beginning of the 19th century, roughly speaking from what we know, the income per head of the UK, probably the richest country at that stage, was about three times the income per head of China as a whole at purchasing power parity. By the middle of the 20th century, that ratio had me moved to 30 to 1, from 3 to 1 to 30 to 1, though in this case, the leading country was the United States. In the last 30 years, the ratio for China has gone from 30 to 1, it didn't change until 1978, to probably about 4 to 1 today. An absolutely staggering transformation. And in India, it's probably gone from 30 to 1 to about 10 to 1. And of course, this sort of convergence is generating astonishingly and unprecedentedly divergent growth rates. What I've done in this chart is a very, very simple chart. It takes IMF data, so all the growth rates are in purchasing power parity. And you can think of every point on this chart as containing the average of the previous 10 years' growth. So it's not that year's growth, it's the average of the previous 10 years. And you can see that up to the end of the last century, the growth rates on average of the developed world, the emerging world, were much the same. They didn't differ very much. That actually was the case for nearly all the post-war period. There was no big shift. Over the last 10 years, the ratio has been three to one. And the 10 years to 2016, the IMF suggests it will be three and a half to one. And that is having the effect of bringing about staggeringly swift changes in the relative weight of economies. Again, I'm using the purchasing power parity measures. I'm not going to go into the debate of whether these are the best measures, what the problems are. I think they are available and they have, I think, on the whole, they're better than anything else. And I'm just going from 1990 to 2016 on the IMF's projections. And back in 1990, and even really in 2000, um, the world was of the following shape. Roughly speaking, the developed countries generated 70% of world output at purchasing power parity. We're talking about 12% of the world population generating about 70% of world output. China and India generated about 4% each. The European Union accounted for 29%, the US 25%, and the rest of the developed countries, mostly Japan, the residual. By 2010, so 20 years later, it was 20 for us in Europe, 20 for the United States, roughly 50% for all the developed countries, and China was 14%. According to the IMS forecast, by 2016, a PPP China will be as big as either the European Union or the United States, and the developed share will be much less than half. So in 25 years, the developed world will have moved from domination to uh, rough equality with the rest. And by the way, in 2016, China and India together will be bigger than either Europe or the United States. And these are early days. As I said, China's GDP per head is still somewhere between a fourth and a fifth of the United States. It's not terribly difficult to imagine China managing to get to be half the United States. Surely nothing is easier to manage, and surely nobody imagines that the Chinese aren't quite as able. Um, and of course, if China's GDP per head were half that of the United States, which might happen in the next 20, 30 years, its economy would be as big as Europe and America together. We are moving into a new world. I want to emphasize, however, that this story of convergence, and this is a slightly complicated chart, is not a universal one. Convergence is difficult. Lots of countries have failed to catch up. China's story, you can see China shooting up in the yellow at the bottom, and the India is below it in the light blue. This steady convergence uh, on the growth, on the developed country levels, this is, US is 100% throughout this, is very rare. In this chart, I've shown the story 
for the seven largest emerging economies in, by GDP at PPP. So in addition to China and India, it's Brazil and Russia, the other two members of the BRICS, also Turkey, Mexico, and Indonesia. And you will see that many countries have not caught up. Convergence is difficult. We shouldn't assume it will necessarily happen. Mexico, for example, has stagnated. That's the second line across the top. Russia collapsed and came up. That's the first line going down the left. Turkey is the third line down. A long period of just going up and down, but a rather successful last 10 years. Brazil, again, a long way down for, 20, for 15 years, now a strong recovery. Then we have China. And sorry, then we have Indonesia again up and down, and then we have the extraordinary story of China and, in, and to a lesser degree India. So the great convergence is essentially a story of China. But what a story! What a story! This process has, in my view, had extraordinarily powerful consequences, and uh, they, of course, have not ended. And I'm just going to list some of them. An enormous labor supply shock had, has had, in my view, very large effects on relative wages for unskilled people. It's not the only reason at all, but it's one of the reasons. Essentially, we have lost the possibility of employing relatively unskilled people in the tradable sectors in our economies. They're out of it. Second, it had a long disinflationary shock period. China lowered world prices for manufacturers in dollars. I think that confused monetary policy very badly in our economies. That's obvious in retrospect. Third, the huge, the emergence of the giant imbalances. I can't go more into that. It's a theme of my most recent book in the uh, last decade, which I think led to some very undesirable macroeconomic and financial consequences. Let me stress, I am not blaming China for the financial crisis, but it was one of the background conditions. More recently, immensely powerful inflationary effects, or more precisely, a massive shift in the terms of trade in favor of commodities and against producers of manufacturers, including ourselves. And of course, ongoing, rapid, and essentially unstoppable, in my view, shifts in global economic activity. Now let me move to the third of my stories about what's going on in the world, which is the crisis. I'm not going to discuss, for lack of time, the preconditions of the crisis, except to note that essentially we are seeing the collapse of a generation-long leverage cycle, predominantly in the private sector, though to a net lesser degree in the public sector. But of course, as always, a collapse of leverage in the private sector always, almost always, has dramatic effects on the public sector as well, both through direct bailouts and through the effects on revenue and spending and therefore fiscal deficits. I would remind you, and I, I haven't followed what the ECB to, did today, I don't know whether they cut rates, I assume they did, um, but I would remind you that four years after this crisis began, we are in an entirely unprecedented environment for monetary and fiscal policy. We are living in a world in which every major central bank is pursuing more aggressive monetary policies than they have ever, ever done before. In addition, the fiscal policy of many major states has essentially the characteristic of wartime public finance. One of my favorite examples is that for the UK, a country which has historically had quite a good fiscal record, the financial crisis aftermath will be the fourth worst fiscal shock in 300 years after the Napoleonic War, the First World War, and the Second World War. This is a major fiscal event for the United States. There's a good chance this shock will be worse than the Second World War. The, um, now, Ra Carmen Reinhardt and Kenneth Rogoff have argued that in their classic book that this time is different, that it takes up to six or seven years for a developed country to get through a financial crisis. My belief is, and I don't have time to argue this at length, is that when roughly half the world economy is in crisis, directly or indirectly, uh, the likelihood is it will take much longer. 
that we are in a deleverage cycle affected by waves of aftershock of this crisis of which the Eurozone crisis is a significant phenomenon, probably for at least a decade from the starting point, which means we're not even halfway through it. Uh, we are in what I believe is essentially a contained depression where the private sectors of most major developed countries are massively trying to deleverage. They are running huge, just staggering financial surpluses in the private sector in every developed country. The private sector of the UK and the US now looks like the German private sector, and the offsets are overwhelmingly in government deficits. And you who want all these government deficits to be eliminated need to explain to me what's going to happen to the private sector while you do this. Um, meanwhile, of course, the Eurozone is in what is effectively an existential crisis. Just to go through very briefly where we are in the crisis, um, this is the GDP, actual levels of GDP for the latest data we have for the G7, the seven largest developed countries. And the first quarter, 2008, is the starting point because for most countries, it was the highest GDP before the crisis. The only exceptions being the United States where it was the second quarter of 2008 and Canada where it was the third quarter you will notice that Canada is the only G7 country, and of course it's the smallest, whose, G, whose output is in any significant way above the starting point today, and it's only 2% there. Germany and the US, relatively successful cases, are just back to the starting point. France is still below the starting point. The UK, Italy, and Japan are 4% below the starting point. As far as I'm concerned, we're all in, still in recession. This is what has happened to public debt for the G7 again, and you will. And I focus on net public debt. I have no interest in gross public debt. I've never understood why anyone cares about it. Uh, what matters is net debt. Um, you will see Japan's net debt has exploded. Italy's has not exploded, a remarkable achievement in the circumstance, but of course it started off very high. France, the UK, and US are experiencing massive rises in net debt. In the UK and US case, by the way, it was extremely low beforehand. Net debt was not a problem. We didn't seem to be in any way in difficulty, but it will more than double over three or four years. Germany is well contained and Canada is well contained. The likelihood in UK and US, in fact, in my view, is net debt will rise by at least 150% relative to GDP over this uh, period. Bond markets have been extraordinarily forgiving for a number of large developed countries, particularly the US, Germany, and the UK, notably in the case of the US and UK, but they have devastated Spain and Italy. Those are the two countries at the top, and they are now really going for France. And that is, of course, an immense shock for the Eurozone, which then leads me to the Eurozone problem, the last part of what I want to talk about on the crisis. This basically shows what happened to the current account structures of the Eurozone before the crisis. The Eurozone started off and has been throughout, actually, roughly speaking, in external balance. That's the blue line relative to Eurozone GDP. And the aggregate current account balances and imbalances within the Eurozone at the starting point were quite small. Unfortunately, unfortunately and tragically, the Eurozone's creation triggered a wave of divergence uh, with massive capital flows from surplus countries, of which the most important were yourselves and Germany, of course, far more important. That's the blue and the brown columns, elements in the column, the countries that shifted into surplus, improvements in competitiveness, massive capital outflows, which went essentially to, um, to Portugal and Greece, which are the, the pink, pink rectangles, Spain, which is the uh, um, which is the purplish uh, rectangle, and Italy, uh, and you will notice that every single one of the large capital recipients were, are now in crisis. Every single one. In fact, in general, the, be the only good indicator of whether you would end up in crisis in this, in, this, in this particular crisis 
It has nothing to do with fiscal policy, it's simply with current account deficits. And that actually relates very closely what, to what Danny was talking about in terms of the difficulties of managing uh, sudden stops in capital flows in countries which are locked into fixed exchange rate systems, but there are no <coughs> systems for managing the crisis across borders, which is essentially the Eurozone situation. This was not, the precursors of these crises was not fiscal, uh, ex extreme fiscal uh, positions. In Greece, the fiscal position was bad. Italy didn't get worse, but in Italy it was quite bad. Portugal, sort of borderline. Ireland had essentially no net public debt before the crisis, zero. Spain's net public debt was far lower than in most of the northern countries before the crisis. What, as I've said before, what, what indicated the severity of the crisis was the scale of the overall borrowing by either the public or the private sectors, something which was never looked at and even now nobody worries about because the assumption is that private lenders know what they're doing, but they don't. Okay, so as I've said many times, the attempts to impose tighter discipline in future through the fiscal policy mechanism is a complete and total waste of time. Um, I can't put it more strongly than that. Um, okay, let me now move very briefly to what I think this means for the Netherlands. It's relatively short in the remaining five minutes or so. Uh, what should you in the Netherlands assume about the ongoing state of the world economy from what I've said? First, it is extremely likely that the emerging countries will continue to rise and above all emerging Asia will continue to rise and above all China and India will continue to rise and since they contain two and a half billion people that matters a lot. Second, the ongoing pressure on advanced countries to adjust the structure of their economies that follows from that cannot be avoided because even if we don't allow them into our import into our markets they surely are going to affect our exports it generates severe pressure on our labor markets sustained pressure on global resources i believe that's an ongoing story um, the uh, then i think we must assume long and messy deleveraging of the over leveraged western private sectors and associated fiscal crises will continue. We're at an early stage. This will, is bound to achieve, impose massive pressure on stability in the Eurozone, which is essentially a gold standard mechanism, which in my view is politically unworkable in the modern European welfare state structure, which is why I never believed the Euro could be made to work, and aging and of course associated fiscal pressures. So what are the strategic options for the Netherlands in looking at this sort of world. And I'm just going to go through six elements and I'll follow them, they're listed here, but I'll go through them now quickly. The first possible strategy, obviously a sensible strategy, is what I call locational competition, which means trying to make one's country the most attractive possible developed country to att entice, attract import, uh, mobile factors of production, and th this works, of course, through lower taxes, uh, lower uh, regulations, and so forth. It's very much the Irish strategy. The disadvantages of it, of course, it, it's a beggar my neighbor policy within the EU. Uh, the capital and labor you attract lack loyalty, and so the gains are insecure. The second strategy is one which I think is much more consistent with the Netherlands history is resource development, which focuses on the upgrading of relatively immobile resources and factors of production, education, and above all, infrastructure. It's a variant of, and more dynamic variant of locational competition. The disadvantages, of course, is that the more ed educated your people are, the more willing they might be to go and live in London or New York, uh, or now Hong Kong, Singapore, or Beijing, and returns on large-scale infrastructure development might turn out to be very low. The third strategic option might be called an aggressive industrial policy system, which would seek to develop and implement a long-term vision of the future development of the economy. It would not be the same as picking winners. It would involve thinking about resources and skills likely to be relevant over decades. Important components would be promotion of high-quality scientific and technological research, support for new enterprises. 
The disadvantage, of course, is that nothing is easier in a world as uncertain as ours to than to make huge mistakes. The fourth strategy, which I suppose you might describe as the UK-US strategy, has been to go for maximum flexibility. It relies on the market to provide economic adjustment. It relies on minimal regulation uh, of labor markets, capital markets, very low taxes. Again, it overlaps with locational competition. The disadvantage is probably impossible inside the European, subversive of the social contract, as it is understood in the Netherlands, and is probably unable to sustain high standards of living that you want in the long run. The fifth strategy is controlled integration, by which I mean a gen move in the sort of direction Danny Roderick was talking about, namely less integration with the world system, tightly managing the interface between national and global economies. It's essentially been the development strategy of China, as he has mentioned. The disadvantages for an individual nation, impossible within the EU, EU and the Eurozone unless the Eurozone or EU itself seeks a protectionist policy at the border. But one issue, of course, that you might well want to look at in this context, which we haven't discussed at all, is labor movement, migration. And the final strategy is to really push for European integration as an economic strategy to accelerate both the economic and political integration of Europe with a view to creating a dynamic domestic economy better able to compete successfully with other giants. The disadvantage, it seems to me, that this has been a long-standing theme of policy in Europe over the last two decades and has not brought substantial results. And so let me conclude on strategies, a combination of locational competition, resource development, and industrial policy look like the best option for the Netherlands within the framework of the EU as it is but the freedom enjoyed by the Netherlands on its own is, of course, very small. Ultimately, like the rest of us in the developed world, we have to adjust to the ongoing changes in the world economy, or as the Chinese might say, the coming irrelevance of the West. Thank you very much.